for them. All right, uh, let's start. So it's a great pleasure to introduce and uh, welcome uh, Professor Tim Barfoot uh, to our uh, seminars. So Tim is professor at the University of Toronto uh, in the Robotics Institute. Uh, he works in the area of autonomy uh, for mobile robotics. Um, a bit about Tim, uh, he has a quite uh, long bio that I will not read in full, I guess, but he's been a, a faculty uh, since 2007. He was a visiting professor in uh, University of Oxford in 2013. Um, he's an associate director at the University of Toronto of the Robotics Institute and, and much more. Uh, he's the uh, author of, uh, of a book on uh, state estimation for robotics from 2017. And he sits on the editorial boards of different journals such as uh, IGRR, uh, Field Robotics, and, uh, and more. And with that, we are very much excited to have you here, Tim. So looking forward to your talk. Great. Thanks so much uh, for the intro, Adam. Good to see you. Let me make sure my slides will share here. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, and just to check, we're looking for like 40 minutes of talking followed by questions, something like that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for coming. Uh, it's a little early for me still, but uh, I think we'll do okay. I just had a copy. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about where I think machine learning uh, can help with robotic state estimation. And you can see actually some of the robots that, uh, that we've worked with over the years uh, on this title slide. I'm gonna try and advance this with my iPad, so hopefully this works. Okay, I thought just one slide telling you a little bit about uh, what my lab does. So we kind of do two things. We like to do bottoms up curiosity driven research. So we're developing new algorithms for robot autonomy. And we kind of touch the whole stack, everything from localization and mapping to planning and control. I've got an example there of one of our planning algorithms uh, called BitStar. And as Adam said, uh, I've also written a book on state estimation that has a number of the algorithms that, uh, that we've worked on over the years. We also do top, uh, bottom, sorry, top down research. So we get involved with industry partners and, and other organizations to try to deploy some of these algorithms for real world applications. Uh, and these are some of the, the robots that we've worked with over the years. Uh, a lot of them are off-road applications. I kind of started in planetary exploration, but my interests have broadened now to lots of different applications of mobile robots. And I think, you know, like many labs, it's probably the interplay of these two different uh, directions of research that really make things interesting, right? You try something bottoms up, uh, and then you take it out, try it in the field and see what the limitations are, and that gives you some new ideas. And so I kind of think of this uh, process as an iterative loop uh, where we can try out new ideas over a long period of time. Today, however, I want to focus in on state estimation for robotics. Um, so particularly a, a big part of what I've done, I guess, over the years is working on these backend state estimation algorithms. So that'll be the focus of today's talk. Uh, and just so that we're all on the same page, uh, for me, state estimation is the process of determining quantities that describe the, the state of the robot. Um, uh, particularly its geometry and, and how that moves over time uh, from noisy sensor data. And I think many of us know that uh, state estimation tools find a lot of applications within robotics, everything from odometry to localization and mapping, calibration, object tracking, and so on. Uh, and I kind of think of this as a <clears throat> core capability that's needed to enable downstream tasks like planning and control. And you can kind of see in the bottom right uh, a video of one of our uh, closed loop uh, robot stacks called Visual Teach and Repeat. Uh, so here we're doing visual localization against maps that we've previously built along this path uh, and then closing a feedback loop around that to get the robot to repeat these paths automatically without GPS. Uh, and I'll talk more about the video in the top right a bit later in the talk. So it's a little early for me to do math, but it's going to be a bit of a mathy talk uh, because we're talking about backend stuff. So I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about getting everyone on the same page with respect to state estimation to make sure we're talking about the same things. So imagine now we've got uh, a motion model and an observation model for a robot. And in this case, we're just going to review some of the classic results, linear Gaussian estimations. We've got linear models. Uh, the state is X, it's unknown. 
we have some inputs that we apply to the robot. We have noise, process noise that corrupts our motion. We have some sensor readings, these Ys, uh, and these are corrupted by some measurement noise. And our job is to estimate the state from the inputs and the noisy sensor readings and knowledge of these models, typically. Uh, my favorite way to solve this problem is to kind of write it at the batch level. So we write everything at the full trajectory level. Uh, you can lift all these quantities up to, to be at the full trajectory level with a number of definitions that I won't go through. Uh, but we can write them down very, very tidily with these uh, lifted forms of the motion and observation models. And then, for example, we could do Bayesian state estimation. So we could, uh, we could write a joint likelihood for the state X and the measurements Y given the inputs V. Uh, and this would be a Gaussian that kind of looks like this. So we've got uh, the mean and the covariance here for this joint state estimate. We could then factor this. So we can always take a joint likelihood we know and factor that into P of X given Y and P of Y. So I can do that and just throw away the P of Y part. Uh, and that gives me P of X given uh, Y and V, the things that I know. Uh, and again, we've got a mean and a covariance. And if I rearrange this, we get back to hopefully uh, for some of you, some familiar equations called the batch linear Gaussian state estimation equations. So this is a linear system of equations for the unknown state X. It's got the inputs and the measurements, and this left-hand side turns out to be the inverse covariance of our estimate. So I kind of think of this as a very classic result. Um, and of course, we can solve this in a number of different ways. In fact, that's not the only way we could have gotten to these familiar batch linear state estimation equations. There are other routes we could have taken as well, right? We could have taken a maximum a posteriori approach where we define some kind of cost function that represents the negative log likelihood of the data. Um, and then we could try to find the X that minimizes that cost function, for example. Another way to think about this problem as, is as a factor graph, right? So we could take these cost terms and we could represent them as like soft constraints between the various state variables. We can have binary constraints, unary constraints, and all of these color-coded terms kind of match up uh, across this diagram. And so we could then try to solve this problem as a factor graph. And either way, we could take any of these approaches, but ultimately, I still kind of think of things as linear algebra. And for me, everything kind of comes back to solving this linear system of equations that I presented on the previous slide. Now, if we're just estimating a robot state and we don't have to worry about landmarks, uh, this, this left-hand side ends up being block tridiagonal, and then we can use a number of different solvers to solve this problem. Uh, the classic being exploiting that sparsity would be the RTS smoother solution, where we do a forward and a backward pass to solve the problem. Forward pass, of course, is known as the Kalman filter. Uh, there's other ways we could solve it. There are so-called square root information filters, uh, and smoothers. Uh, I like one called the Cholesky forward backwards smoother. Uh, but we could also do things like Gaussian belief propagation. And in fact, for this linear Gaussian problem, the sum product rule would be exact in this case. So these are classic results. And I think a lot of what we do in robotic state estimation, it kind of still likes to reference back to this very classic set of results. But the question is, how can we, how can we actually move things forward to more realistic situations while still leveraging some of the nice things that we've learned from this classic linear Gaussian problem. So in real robotic state estimation, there are a number of things that we kind of need to think about beyond that classic setup. So I'll, I'll, I'll briefly cover, this is in my outline of the talk actually. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, how we've done some work on continuous time trajectories, very briefly talk about how I like to handle rotations uh, in, in state estimation. And then the lion's share of the talk will actually be on two topics towards the end, uh, not towards the end, but the, the last two thirds of the talk will be these, these new topics uh, where we're really focusing in on uh, uh, learning the models that we would want to use within state estimation. So taking a data-driven approach to try to think about how we can learn some of the models and not assume that we have those a priori. Uh, so we'll take uh, a look at two different approaches we've been exploring, one uh, that's based on Gaussian variational inference, and a second that uses Koopman kernel embeddings uh, to lift the problem up into a higher dimensional space where it's easier to deal with. Okay, so I'll briefly review these two things on the left, and then I'll, I'll leave most of the time to do these new topics on the right. Okay, so continuous time trajectories. Why, why, why 
My way, <laughs> ah, it's too early. Why might we be interested in dealing with continuous time trajectories? There are a lot of sensors in robotics uh, that actually uh, are motion distorted. Uh, so things like spinning radars, spinning lidars, we kind of assume that when we get a LiDAR scan that all of those points that we got uh, came from the same pose. The robot was in the same pose when it gathered that information. But that's not actually true because a lot of these things are mechanically actuated. Uh, and so in fact, as the robot moves, the data becomes distorted in the acquisition of the scan. The same is true of rolling shutter cameras uh, and other types of sensors. So one way that we can start to deal with this is to go back to our state estimation problem and now think of the robot's trajectory as a continuous function of time. So now we could say that we have some state x of t that's a, a continuous function. We still have process noise, measurements, um, inputs, measurement noise, uh, but now we're going to think about it a little bit differently. Um, so in this case, the motion model is a continuous differential equation, and the observation model is still assumed to be taking discrete measurements because most of our sensors are digital. And really what we'd like to be able to do is have a bunch of measurements at specific times, uh, but then we might like to be able to query the robot's trajectory at any time of interest after the fact, after we've done state estimation. And this would allow us to, for example, go back and figure out exactly where the robot was when it gathered every point in a LiDAR scan, for example, because we could query the trajectory at the time of interest of that acquisition. So how could we deal with that? There's a few different ways of dealing with continuous time trajectories in state estimation. My favorite way is by thinking of the robot's trajectory as a Gaussian process. And so we can, we can actually leverage tools from machine learning uh, to think about this as a Gaussian process regression problem. In fact, if you go way back to the 1960s, Kalman and Busi were already talking about Gaussian processes as, as uh, trajectory representations way back then. And so how can we turn what looks like just a least squares estimation problem into a Gaussian process regression problem. The answer is we can take our motion model and we can actually stochastically integrate this in closed form to produce a kernel function for this problem. And in fact, this kernel function now has some very nice structure to it because it obeys the, the Markov property uh, that comes from the, the fact that it was derived from a stochastic differential equation. So we can take this motion model, integrate it. We now have a kernel function. And then basically what you can say is that we're going to do Gaussian process regression with this prior and have a number of measurements of the state. Can someone mute? I can hear, uh, I can hear a bit of noise there. Uh, and so when we set up this problem, it turns out that there's actually a nice separation principle that happens. We can end up estimating the trajectory at all of the measurement times first. And then we can go back and we can query the trajectory after the fact. And that's, that's actually something that's just built into the way that Gaussian process regression works, right? We can, we can learn the model from the data points and then we can go back and do inference at particular query points uh, in that Gaussian process. And it turns out then that the choice of the prior in fact determines the interpolation scheme that we use. So if we pick this motion model, we get a very particular way of doing interpolation that uh, essentially obeys the motion model. And the kernel function, in fact, has this structure to it owing to the fact that it came from a stochastic differential equation that obeys the Markov property. And this means that we can actually do Gaussian process regression quite efficiently. Normally, the cost of, of doing a query would be cubic in the number of data points. Uh, but with this type of prior, it turns out to just be linear in the number of data points. In fact, the query ends up being order one because you only need the data points on uh, the two times that, that bracket the query time uh, in, in the query. And so the initial solve turns out to be order K for the number of measurements that you have or times that you have. And then each query is order one. And if you have N of those, it would be order N to do the queries. Uh, and it turns out then that at the measurement times, we're doing exactly, if it was a linear problem, we're doing exactly the same thing that we would have done in the classic least squares the near Gaussian estimation problem that I presented at the beginning, the only thing that ends up being different is how we do the query. Uh, I should also say that the other thing that's a little bit different is that the fact that we've used this particular motion prior and stochastically integrated it tells us exactly how to build uh, the, the covariances that are associated and actually the, 
the A and the Q associated with the motion model. So it's a very particular way of building those. But in the end, solving at the measurement times is exactly the same as uh, the classic discrete time least squares problem. Only now we have actually a more principled way to build uh, the prior. Uh, and we can interpolate and extrapolate cleanly uh, using the same scheme that we used uh, to build that motion model. So we don't have to pick some ad hoc way of interpolating after the fact. It's built into the, into the problem. So that's just a little review of some things we've done with continuous time estimation. I would encourage you to, to take a look at, at this Gaussian process approach to doing continuous time trajectory estimation. I also just wanted to briefly talk about rotations and how we handle those. Um, so I think many, many people that have worked with mobile robots uh, realize that uh, how to represent uncertainty for poses gets a little bit complicated. Um, and particularly the, the thing that throws a, a wrench in the works is how to deal with rotations. And you know, there's these classic diagrams uh, from probabilistic robotics and this great paper by uh, Greg Chirikjian's group uh, where they said the banana distribution is Gaussian. And so if you, if you take a classic you know, differential drive mobile robot motion model, that's, that's uh, driven by white noise and you propagate that forward and draw samples from it, you kind of get this thing that happens where the, the robot's state kind of spreads out in this, in this banana distribution. And it turns out that becomes fairly easy to model uh, using uh, what are called matrix lead groups, if you haven't seen those before. And so what we can do is, is think about, you know, how can we represent uncertainty for rotations? Uh, they don't happen to be vectors. They, they have a, they're different mathematical objects that have different properties. But the way that our group and many others, I guess, also like to represent uh, uncertainty for rotations is to actually exploit the structure of these, these so-called matrix lead groups. And so what we could do is we can take a vector in Euclidean space, a random vector, and we Basically, the way we would turn that into a, a random sample of a rotation is that we would push it through the matrix exponential, multiply on the right by a, a mean rotation, and this would give us a random sample of a rotation. And so our way of representing uncertainty is sort of this um, surjective mapping of Gaussian noise through this matrix exponential. And this allows us to represent things like this banana distribution uh, quite nicely. Um, and if you like, you can kind of think of it like this. Uh, we've got a mean rotation that's kept as a rotation matrix, and then we keep the uncertainty sort of in the tangent space of the rotations. And that allows us to, to kind of get the best of both worlds. We, we can still work with Gaussians, but we can work with rotations that, that actually have constraints on them. Um, and for optimization, we can kind of do a similar thing. We can think about trying to optimize a function of a rotation and I think I skipped saying that rotations come with constraints. Sorry about that. It's still a little bit early. Um, and the way we like to deal with optimization problems then is to think about how we can do those um, still obeying the constraints. So what we'd like to do is avoid having to do constrained optimization because that gets a little bit complicated and expensive. We like to turn this back into some kind of unconstrained optimization problem. And so effectively what we're doing is on manifold uh, optimization. Um, uh, if you if you look into the to the differential geometry literature, this is sort of called uh, Ramanian gradient descent or Ramanian Newton's method, something like that, uh, where we're actually doing unconstrained optimization on the manifold that represents rotations. But it turns out in practice, you don't need to know very much about differential geometry to do this. You just need to do a few matrix manipulations. And so, what we could do is take a uh, an optimization problem that has this constrained variable involving a rotation. And we can turn that into an unconstrained optimization problem by just applying a perturbation to our rotation that actually lives up in the tangent space of the group of rotations. And this turns the problem back into a, an unconstrained optimization for this small perturbation. Only now we have to iterate. So we can solve this unconstrained problem. And then we take our perturbation, our optimal perturbation, apply it to our initial guess for the rotation, and that produces a new rotation we would need to iterate that. So it's a way of handling rotations uh, very cleanly. Uh, and so we do this quite a bit in our group uh, to we use these lead groups to represent uncertainty for rotations and also to perform optimization. Um, and I would just advertise that it, if you haven't done it this way, it's great because um, it avoids any dealing with any uh, singularities that come with a lot of representations of rotations. 
we end up doing unconstrained optimizations and all of the manipulations uh, are basically at the matrix level, which makes it less likely to make mistakes in your algebra. So that is a bit of a whirlwind of a couple of topics that, that are near and dear to my heart that we've worked on quite a bit. Uh, here's just an example of putting those pieces together. So here, this robot is, uh, actually, this is a robot that's estimating motion from a sequence of LiDAR data. And you can see in this video here, we're actually treating LiDAR a little bit differently than most people. Um, we're using LiDAR intensity images, and we're extracting features and just tracking those in these LiDAR intensity images. However, this LiDAR is kind of a, a strange one. It's got these mechanically actuated mirrors, and so there's a lot of distortion. Like every pixel in one of these LiDAR intensity images comes at a different time. So there's a rolling shutter effect. And so every one of these features that we're estimating motion from has a different timestamp. However, if we represent the robot's trajectory as a continuous function of time, and we associate every feature appropriately to the correct point on that trajectory, we can do very accurate state estimation. And what you're seeing in the video here is actually, we didn't use all of the raw points in the scan, but what we did was we went back and queried the trajectory at all of the times of every point in the raw scan, and then we put those back together into a very crisp point cloud based on that interpolation scheme. So this is an example of using a smaller number of measurement times to estimate the motion and then querying the trajectory at a large number of times to build a model after the fact. And so all of that becomes enabled by the tools that I just mentioned, the continuous time trajectory estimation, as well as uh, dealing with rotations uh, as part of the trajectory. Uh, and if you're interested in this, uh, you can check out uh, my book. There's also a number of open source tools. So uh, we have, a, I guess, a competing solver to, to GTSAM. Um, it doesn't do as many things, but it does a few other, it's like a niche solver. If you want to do continuous time trajectories, uh, you could check out our Steam solver, which is on GitHub. And also there are some libraries related to uh, the underlying leak group math tools that we use within the, within the solver. Uh, also, I, I'm actually on sabbatical right now, and I'm working on a second edition of this book. So if anyone actually reads the book and has any ideas for, for extensions, uh, please email me about that. Okay, so that was, I'm gonna skip that one. That was sort of the, uh, the, the retrospective part of the talk. So now I wanna talk about a couple of new things uh, that we're working on. And so here, we're gonna go back to state estimation again. And now we're gonna think about what happens if we don't actually have all of the models uh, that we typically require in these backend solvers? How can we use data to help us figure this out? And so we'll start with uh, uh, a new topic we've been working on called Gaussian variational inference. So let's go back to our problem now. And now, just to, just to confuse you, I'm going to change the notation to these Greek symbols uh, instead of the x's, y's, uh, and v's. And I just, I'm doing that to indicate that now, actually, we might have nonlinear motion and observation models. So the models I showed you previously were, were linear. Uh, now imagine we've got f and g, which are nonlinear motion and observation models. And I think many of us probably, the first thing we might try when we're faced with these is we would take our, our old friend linearization and try to linearize the models and then go back to the tools that we've been talking about in this, in this talk, right? It's the RTS smoother, the common filter, things like that, MAP batch estimators. Um, and then we would iteratively linearize. So that's certainly one thing we can do. Um, but you know, we've been thinking about what are some other things that we could do rather than just deciding to linearize up front. So another, another thing that we could think about is a more general starting point for defining the state estimation problem, uh, variational inference. And so the idea here is uh, what we really want to do is just start with some kind of data likelihood objective. And here it's a negative log P of gamma, the, the sensor measurements. And we might have some unknown parameters theta. Uh, so these might parameterize our state estimate or other things in our model. And we might just want to minimize, in this case, this data likelihood objective, produce the state estimate that is most likely to explain the data. Sounds like MAP estimation, right? But it turns out that you can take this data likelihood objective and there's a classic decomposition of it into two terms. One that's the negative KL divergence between the true posterior and an estimate of that posterior. And the other is this upper bound term. Uh, so this, this is not new to us. This actually comes from way back in machine learning. Uh, and here, Q is now going to be our 
our approximation. So let's say we choose that to be a Gaussian, right? We work a lot with Gaussian estimates. What if we were to choose that to be a Gaussian? How could we, how could we leverage this framework? Well, typically what we do in MAP state estimation is we just try to find the mean that, that minimizes some kind of objective. Here, we're actually gonna try to optimize all of the parameters of our Gaussian. So not just the mean, but also the, the covariance to try to minimize this data likelihood objective. So this is a little bit different now than MAP, right? We're optimizing the entire parameterization of the Gaussian together. We might also have these parameters theta that could be the, the model, that they're parameters of our model. They could be the A, the A, C, Q, R matrices in a linear model, for example. And it turns out that if you wanna both optimize your model and find the best trajectory, you can do this using expectation minimization in this case, because we're trying to minimize. And the way this works graphically is we wanna push down this blue data likelihood objective. The KL divergence is very difficult to work with because you need knowledge of the full posterior. But you'll notice in the upper bound term, we actually only need this joint likelihood of the state and the data, which is something that's easier to work with. We don't actually need to do inference in this case. And so the way this works is we're gonna to try to drive down that upper bound term, which will then push our data likelihood objective down. And we do this in two steps. Uh, in the E step, we hold the, the parameters, our model parameters fixed, and we, we basically do state estimation, and this pushes down the upper bound term. And then in the M step, where we're gonna to try to learn our model parameters, we hold the distribution for the trajectory fixed, and then we optimize with respect to the model parameters. And this also pushes the upper bound term down. It usually makes the KL divergence bigger, but that has the effect of pushing the actual objective that we care about even lower. And if we iterate back and forth between the E step and the M step, we can actually come up with simultaneously the best trajectory in terms of both the mean and the covariance if we parameterized as a Gaussian and the best model parameters for our system. So it's a way of unifying if you like, system identification and state estimation under a single data likelihood objective. Um, so here is again just the, the upper bound term, which is the one that we're typically working with in both the E step and the M step. And this can be rewritten as an expectation over this joint likelihood of the state and the, and the, the measurements. And this other regularizing term, which basically says we don't want the uncertainty to become too small, right? We have to penalize the system for, for becoming too certain because it, it could exactly or overfit to the data. And in the E step, what we're basically doing is optimizing both the mean and it, it actually, in our case, the inverse covariance matrix uh, to try to minimize this upper bound term. And in 1D, that kind of looks like this. Here's what the data likelihood objective looks like. We're taking steps in the space of both the mean and the inverse covariance uh, and, and this is what we would do. We would try to get to this exact point here. In fact, there's an algorithm that we came up with that is able to do this in, in high dimensions called exactly sparse Gaussian variational inference. If you like, you can think of it as a generalization of MAP estimation because we're actually optimizing the, the covariance matrix as part of the process. We're not picking that after the fact with the Laplace approximation. Uh, we're able to fully exploit the, the structure of the graphical model. So if there's sparsity, like we typically like to exploit in robotics, we can exploit that. Uh, it works even for loopy graphical models. Uh, it has the same big O complexity as MAP state estimation, where you're only optimizing the mean, interestingly. Um, and if anyone has ever wondered how we could do uh, um, something like the sigma point filter for batch estimation, this actually provides one way of doing that. So we can actually take all these expectations and we can evaluate those using Gaussian cubature. So you can actually produce a derivative free version of state estimation, which is kind of neat. There's also a connection to natural gradient descent in the optimizer that we came up with. And I think one of the big benefits is that we can fold in this parameter learning in the M step. So I'm not gonna go through all the details of the solver, but I'll direct you to uh, to this paper that we had in IJRR a couple of years ago now. In the M step, this is the part that's actually kind of interesting. We can actually now effectively do unsupervised parameter learning. We're using the estimated, the distribution for the estimated trajectory as a training signal 
to now try to learn parameters or do system identification for the for our system. Um, and without ground truth, we can try to learn almost any anything in the system. We could learn model matrices in the motion and observation models. We could learn covariances for our process or measurement noise. And I'm going to show you one example right after this where we learn much more general parameters, where we actually plug a deep neural network in to represent one of our models and then try to learn the parameters of those, uh, of those weights, actually learn the weights. So this is kind of a, an interesting way of thinking about and tying in uh, machine learning to our, to our state estimation problem under a unified optimization problem. So let's, let's take a look at an application of this. So uh, the task is gonna to be to estimate motion uh, from a sequence of dense LiDAR scans uh, on a car. So it's gonna be a, a LiDAR odometry problem. Uh, this is actually just a data set. Uh, if you're interested in an all weather data set, we just put this out uh, very recently, um, over a year of data uh, from this car driving around in Toronto. So let's think about this LiDAR odometry problem. There's lots of different approaches to LiDAR odometry in the literature, everything from you know, end to end, deep learned, uh, oops, I wrote radar navigation, uh, sorry, LiDAR, LiDAR navigation. Um, and then on the other hand, fully classic algorithms with handcrafted uh, front-end features like Loam. Uh, and what we're gonna talk about is something that lives somewhat in the middle where we try to get the best of both worlds. So we're gonna use deep learning to extract interesting key points from our dense LiDAR scans. Uh, we're gonna combine that with this classic backend that hopefully many of us are familiar with and that I've been talking about in this, in this talk. Uh, and we think this actually makes sense because Deep learning is often going to, to make mistakes. It's never going to be perfect. And having all of the tools at, a, at the ready in the back end to kind of upgrade the quality of the information through things like outlier rejection uh, seem to make sense. Only we're not just going to cobble this together. We're now going to do this under a single data likelihood objective using this exactly sparse Gaussian variational inference that I mentioned. Uh, and so, in fact, this is interesting because the estimator Often when you think about combining an estimator with deep learning, you think, oh, the estimator has to be differentiable. That's not the case under this framework. Because we're doing this expectation maximization approach, the, the estimator doesn't need to be differentiable. So you can add in all the usual bells and whistles that you would like to the back end and still make it work uh, with, with deep learning. So how would that look? So imagine now we've got a sequence of LiDAR scans. Uh, so these are representing different times. Uh, here's our state, our trajectory. In the E step, basically what we do is we take our LiDAR scans, we push them through a deep neural network that's parameterized by these weights data. We produce a number of key points with descriptors uh, represented here. We then have a differentiable matching step. So we find matches between scans using these higher level features and their descriptors. And that's done in a completely differentiable way. So that part all has to be differentiable. And that can basically be built into a factor in this factor graph. So that factor is differentiable. We then take that factor and we can put in any other factors that we like. Our classic motion model factors could be right here. And then we do uh, this, this uh, exactly sparse Gaussian variational inference to estimate the distribution for the trajectory. Okay, so that can be done basically in, in closed form once we have all the factors. Quick question, Tim. Yeah. What is the matching here, this point? Yeah, so the matching is, uh, is done in sort of a, uh, a weighted fashion. So like every feature is compared to every other feature and you get a weight. And then the, you know, if you take all the matches for uh, say this feature against all of these other features over here, each one of those will have a weight and then the, the geometric location of the matched feature is sort of a, a weighted sum of the geometric locations of all of the features. It's a, that step's a little bit, we didn't invent that, other, others have done that. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a, if you, you know, normally you would take the best matched feature, but that's not, a, you know, max is not a differentiable function. So it's effectively a soft max. Uh, that makes it differentiable. Okay, so we've done the E step, which is basically classic state estimation. The neural network weights are fixed. But then in the M step, we hold the distribution of the trajectory fixed, and we can basically do 
back propagation through the neural network to improve the features that we're using to, to estimate the motion. So this is completely unsupervised now. Uh, and we could use standard deep learning tools for that. So although we've started from a common data likelihood objective, we uh, don't have to write all, all different tools. We could still use standard tools for both the back end and the, and the front end. Excuse me, and, if I may. Yeah. Um, could you go back a slide for a sec? Yes, sure. Do you, um, does someone choose for you what um, uh, states are matched, are matched to what states? Or are all states matched to all states? And then yeah, in, like in the whole trajectory. So, so we, yes. we do this, yes. when we're doing learning, we do this in sort of a mini batch uh, uh, setup. So we, we take like a small subsequence of the trajectory. And the matches are actually, uh, within that window, the matches actually look like this pattern of factors here. So we're always matching, in this case, we're matching all of the scans back to the first scan in the window. But you could try to match, you could add in additional factors if you want. We experimented with that and we found this worked reasonably well. Um, it works because you're tying, you're putting these additional factors in here as well to tie things together. But you could pick whatever pattern you like. But yeah, we're not trying to match things from the start of the trajectory to the end. We're, we're working in little mini batches. We're randomly picking those mini batches during training from different places in the trajectory, in the training trajectory. Thanks. Okay, so an example of that working uh, is here. So on, let's just pay attention to the left-hand video for a second. So this is uh, lighter data from the Oxford data set. And what you're looking at is the training process unfolding. So when we begin, the, the neural network is initialized to random weights. And you can see that we're, we're going back and forth between estimating the trajectory and improving the, the weights that extract the features. And we're able to simultaneously estimate this trajectory and figure out what features to pay attention to from the LiDAR data um, without any ground truth. And then on the right, you can see an example at inference time at testing uh, from the Kitty data set, so a totally different data set where we're extracting these features. So this is just the E step running in a sliding window fashion now. So the training has already been completed on the Oxford data. Now we're just doing, just doing testing. And you know, it comes out pretty well. It works. It's not as good as the very best hand-coded ladder odometry, but I would say it's respectable. Uh, and so if you're more interested in more details, uh, the paper reference is there. And that paper actually won the best student paper award at ICRA last year. So that was one way of trying to think about learning models using this Gaussian variational inference technique. It looks like I might have just enough time to squeeze in the second uh, approach, which is uh, Koopman kernel embeddings. Totally different way of thinking about uh, learning models. So we can go, uh, oh, actually, yeah, let's start with this. So it turns out that uh, in machine learning, a lot of problems turn out to be easier if you lift them up into higher dimensions. And the classic example is uh, support vector machines. So you might want to build a classifier that separates the red dots from the blue dots. And in the original space where you're given the data, it might be hard to build that classifier. But if you lift that up into some higher dimensional space, uh, it turns out you could maybe use a linear classifier. That's basically how SVMs work. And so the classic example of that is this XOR data. So there's no way to draw a line that will separate these red and blue classes perfectly. But if you use this set of features, so if you just design three new features, X1, X2, and X3, where X1 is just the original XI1, XI2, and then the product of XI1 and XI2, and you replot your data in this higher dimensional feature space, you can now separate the data exactly using a plane. And for dynamics, it turns out this idea holds as well. You might start with some nonlinear motion model. Uh, it turns out if you lift this up into a higher dimensional space, it's always possible to write this. It might be an infinite dimensional space. It's always possible to exactly write these dynamics uh, as a linear model. Uh, and so this is based on Koopman theory. There's this paper that's gaining traction in robotics uh, by Koopman, 1931. Um, people have been looking at this for, for doing things like system identification and control. So we wanted to think about how could we use this in state estimation. Uh, and an example of lifting dynamics up uh, is here. So here's a two coupled ordinary differential equations. They're nonlinear because there's this xi1 squared term here. Uh, 
But if you design three new features, XI1, XI2, and XI1 squared, you can rewrite these dynamics exactly as a linear system. In this case, as a very low dimensional linear system. In general, it might have to be a very high dimensional linear system to get the dynamics to be exact, possibly even infinite dimensional. But we can truncate that and, and get a pretty good approximation. So it's a different way of thinking about linearization by lifting it up into a higher dimensional space. So what's the idea here for state estimation? We can start with our nonlinear state estimation models again. And that, you know, we've talked about how our first move might be to try to linearize these uh, to produce something that looks like our, our linear equations from the very start of the talk. Um, but a different thing we can do is, is, uh, is to go this route. So one thing we're going to do is actually restrict our nonlinearity to be a control affine style nonlinearity, which is pretty typical for representing motion models in robotics. A lot of our common motion models can be written in a control affine form. We have a nonlinear function of the state uh, multiplied with the, the inputs. And then it turns out that you can actually embed this control affine system as a high dimensional uh, time invariant bilinear system, meaning you've got products of the inputs and the state. Uh, so this, this is actually shown by Ram Vasudevan's group uh, in this paper here. So that's not new to us. Uh, but we'll, what we noticed is that for state estimation, if the inputs are already known, you can actually reorganize this into a time varying linear system by just taking the inputs uh, and moving them into a, a new time varying state transition matrix A. So it turns out then we can take this nonlinear system, we have to lift it up into this higher dimensional, sorry, <laughs> write it as control affine, lift it up into this higher dimensional time invariant bilinear system, then rearrange it as a higher dimensional time varying system. And then we're actually back to linear equations. In fact, these equations and these equations are identical. Only now in the, the approach that we normally do, this is like low dimensional and we have to iteratively relinearize as we, as we do our state estimate. Only here, the linearization happens once and upfront. We don't have to relinearize. So now we have exactly a linear system uh, in this higher dimensional space. So if you like, what we're doing is we're taking low dimensional nonlinear system and writing it exactly as a linear system in this higher dimensional space. Okay. And so how can we then use this for state estimation? Well. If we have a bunch of data in this lower dimensional space, we just have to pick these lifting functions. And I won't get into the details, but we use random Fourier features to do this. Um, so we lift this up to like a few hundred dimensions for each state. We write this as a time varying, sorry, time invariant bilinear system. And then it turns out that what we can do is actually learn all of these model matrices, the A, B, H, C, and the covariances for the process noise and the measurement noise, we can learn all of those in closed form just using a least squares fit. That turns out to be very easy to do. So every system now looks exactly like this one and we only need this one algorithm for figuring out all of the model matrices in this lifted space. We then convert this to this linear system, uh, time varying linear system. And then we just do classic uh, RTS smoother in this higher dimensional space. So no, nothing fancy on the estimation side. We're just good because it's linear. We can just take the classic linear Gaussian algorithms that I talked about at the very start of the talk and use those only now in a very high dimensional space. Uh, so we get back exactly the batch equations we had uh, like on slide two of the talk. I uh, think quick question, how do you decide about the dimensionality of that space? Is there some specific method or is it realistic? Yeah, we, we experimented. I'll show you an ablation study at the end if there's time um, where we looked at how many features do we need to keep uh, and the effect on the, the quality of the estimation. Oh, cool. thanks. Um, and then once you've done this estimate, you're, you've now got an estimate in the very high dimensional space. You have to drop this back down to the original, the original space and you can use something called the representer theorem to do that. So what does that look like? Uh, we tried this out on an ultra wideband localization problem. So we have a roving sensor that gets ranges to a number of ultra wideband anchors uh, that are quite noisy. And we gathered some data by driving a robot around. Uh, uh, this is like a small scale lab experiment, obviously, and the robots uh, gathering wheel odometry and getting these ranges to these anchors on the wall. Uh, so the data kind of looked like that. Uh, we tried to make it hard uh, to model by 
putting some metal plates in front of the anchors, which would just you know, add some biases to the ranges that are being measured so that the, the standard off the shelf uh, model of the sensor might not actually be that good, just to show how, how our data learning would uh, be beneficial. And I will say in this version of the work, we do actually need ground truth in the training phase to learn the models. We're actually working on removing that assumption at the moment, but for now, in the model learning part, we actually have to have ground truth. So there's actually a Vicon system. So we actually have wheelodometry, the ranges to the anchors, and Vicon data uh, in the model learning phase. We then learn this uh, time invariant bilinear system in the high dimensional space. And then we just solve the batch linear state estimation equation. So th this video is actually showing uh, the RTS smoother solving the batch state estimation equations uh, in the forward backward passes. So you're seeing the forward pass right now. So this is basically the Coleman filter based on the learned models. It's a little bit noisy, but remember, we didn't have any models to begin with. No motion model, no observation model. This is all completely learned from the data. Uh, now you'll see it switch over to the backward pass uh, of the RTS smoother. And we're doing quite a bit better here, right? We, we're actually tracking the, the ground truth reasonably well. Um, even compared, you know, it looks a little bit noisy compared to what you might normally see, but these are quite noisy sensors. And if you look at a, at a model-based estimator, it doesn't actually look any better than this, even though that we didn't have any model to begin with. Uh, qualitatively, we did actually compare this to like a classic uh, RTS smoother where we, we had a model of the system. And you can see on the left, qualitatively, uh, our errors look a little bit smaller and a little more consistent than the model-based smoother. Um, and it's just, I think, because we can pick up a more subtle cues from the data by using this higher dimensional model. Uh, to Vedim's question, how many features do we need? So this is just showing, uh, as we increase the number of features representing the state uh, at each time, how does, the, how does the error drop? And this pink line represents sort of how good the model-based smoother is. So we can see after a few hundred features, we're already doing better than the model-based smoother. Uh, and then kind of there's diminishing returns after that. So it's kind of good news that there's a knee in the curve. We only need, uh, you know, maybe 200 <laughs> dimensions uh, to be able to estimate this. Uh, and we can also look at how much training data we need in order to, to learn the models. Um, and it's also a reasonable amount. Okay, so I'm gonna try to wrap up. I'm just keeping an eye on the clock. Uh, so what did we cover today? Where did, where can, well, the title of the talk was where can machine learning help robotic state estimation? We saw a few places where tools from machine learning uh, could in fact help us. So in the original part of the work, uh, tying things into Gaussian process regression for continuous time state estimation. Then we learned about variational inference and expectation maximization for simultaneously doing state estimation and, and system identification. We even tied deep neural networks into our state estimation at that point. And then in this last part, we talked about kernel embeddings, Koopman embeddings, um, we use tools like random Fourier features. So there's all these different things that we can grab from machine learning and sort of build them into these classic state estimation tools without giving up on the great results uh, from the linear Gaussian uh, stuff at the very beginning, it's sort of marrying these things together, I think. I know in general, moving forward, we'd actually probably like features of a lot of these different projects to be combined. And, you know, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but Certainly in robotics, we'd like to have continuous time trajectories to handle asynchronous data and these motion distorted sensors. We obviously have to handle rotations properly. We'd like to do unsupervised learning. Uh, we'd like to do that in a very data efficient way. We'd like to leverage deep neural networks because they're good at handling rich sensor data. But maybe something like Koopman embeddings might be better for representing motion models and try to learn those from data. So maybe some combination of all of these might be an interesting thing to move towards. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about it, but some of the other things going on in the lab, I was talking mainly about the back end uh, today, but uh, we also do work on the front end. So we've been looking at how to learn features to match Google Earth images uh, to live camera images from UAVs to do localization. Uh, we've done lots of work on uh, visual path following. I showed a video right at the start, and we've been looking at how to use deep learning to match features across severe lighting and weather change. Um, and actually, I had an IROS keynote talk if you want details on that that you can look up. Uh, and then another thing we're doing is learning to predict semantic classes from LiDAR data so that we can take our point clouds, classify them up front at the point level, and then send off different parts of the point cloud to different parts of our autonomy stack. So dynamic objects, static objects, things that could move that aren't moving right now, we'd like to be able to sort of 
semantically separate all of these different types of points so that we can send those off to different parts of the pipeline. So that's another place where we've been thinking about using machine learning in the front end. Uh, with that, I'd like to, to thank all of our, you know, I, I did all the talking, the students did all the work uh, and my great collaborators. And uh, you can see some of our industrial sponsors there at the bottom. So thanks very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any further questions. Thanks so much, Tim. It's very, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, if anybody has a question, uh, now is the time. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, the EM procedure that you're using uh, usually converges to a local uh, minimum, right? Or, yes, sir. Which part? Of the, I missed. The, I missed the, which part of the talk we talked about? The variational. About inference? the the EM procedure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, Definitely, EM converges to a local minimum. Absolutely. Local, uh, yeah. So, uh, and you're actually using it online. I mean, uh, recursively the, during the, the estimation process, or just to estimate. No, no, we're no, we're only using that in the in the training. So the alternation between the E step and the M step, we're only doing that when we're learning the model parameters. But then when at when we run live, uh, okay. we only run the E step. Okay. So the e, EM procedure is just happening for training model model identification. Yeah, otherwise it could uh, easily diverge, but uh, if you're using it uh, in runtime. Okay, yeah. good, thank you. Yeah, and because we're, because we're you know, I guess one, one thing that seems to help with local minima, because we're picking these mini batches of the trajectory randomly, uh, and then doing stochastic gradient descent for the training of the neural network parameters and not examples, uh, the fact that there are some Basically, we're using a subset of the data, which is essentially stochastic gradient descent. Um, that seems to help quite a bit with local minima. So if you just train on the whole trajectory at once, it's much easier to get stuck in local minima. Okay, great. Thanks. By the way, we are trying to actually do the E step and the M step online for some uh, some covariance estimation at the moment. So I'll let you know how that works out. <laughs> okay. A quick question. Can you um, go back to your last part where you show the uh, linear formulation with the embedding? Yeah, let me try and jump slides rather than having to. Uh, maybe here? You compare the two, the you know, standard, this, yeah, this one, right? This so, one, right? Right. So on the right, you you got your linear formulation, but with much higher, you know, higher dimensional mat matrices, basically. That's right. Yeah. So can you comment maybe uh, about runtime or how how much time does it take to actually solve the system? Yeah. So interestingly, the when you build this into like the batch state estimation equations, you still have all the usual sparsity patterns that we would have, except that all of the block matrices are now bigger. Right. So instead of like each A matrix being three by three or six by six, now they're going to be 200 by 200. <laughs> right. So uh, it, it actually runs in real time, amazingly. It runs faster than real time. Uh, and I think the key is we, we still exploit the, you know, the Markov property and the, uh, at the batch level, the sparsity of the problem. We're actually trying to do SLAM in the higher dimensional space now. So you still have this block arrowhead uh, matrix, but it's enormous, right? Each of the blocks is, is really right. big. But it, it's, you know, if you're using sparse matrix uh, library, it seems to work pretty fast, amazingly. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the big O complexity is still the same, I would say. <laughs> it's just the coefficient is, is different. When you say you're going to you're going to try to do SLAM, are you talking about a smoothing setting? Or, um... Yeah, yeah, batch estimation in the higher dimensional space. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Yeah, we actually, we're, it's running, it's just, it doesn't look good yet. <laughs> so there's something still wrong with it. And how come do you, do you not need to repeat the, um, the calculation, that transformation to this embedding multiple times? I mean- Yeah, that, that's the interesting part, once. right? So the, yeah, you only have to do it once, right? It's a right. one right. one shot linearization. Right. right. And I think the answer is because it's, there's a lot more information in that initial initial process, right? You're turning it into this much higher dimensional space. So it's a richer representation of the data than in the, in the low dimensional space. That's why you can get away with it. I didn't talk about the, the lifting functions, but 
we, we don't use anything specialized to this problem. We just picked these random Fourier features um, that were derived from like a squared exponential kernel. So they're, they're very generic as well. And we've tried this on a few different problems and the same features seem reasonably good. So there's something about having the capacity to represent the richness of a model with a few hundred states instead of three that allows us to deal with the, it's, it's enough to represent these types of nonlinearities that we have in robotics. They're not very complicated nonlinearities, right? So it, it seems reasonable that uh, you might not need an, you know, a million variables to represent them. One way I think about these features is, is like you're keeping more terms in a, in a Taylor series expansion, right? Something like that. And calculating the coefficients is done one shot style at once, one time, and that's all. Uh, which coefficients do you mean? So if you use the analogy to Taylor series, you have to oh, calculate. Yeah, yeah right? that's right. That's right. It would be, yeah. I mean, it's an analogy, but. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like if you go back to those examples I gave of, of lifting things into those simple examples of lifting things in a higher dimensional space, one set of features you could pick is just all the powers of x, right? You could pick x, x squared, x cubed, x to the four. And then your lifting function would be kind of like the coefficients in a Taylor series. Oh. Any more questions from you guys? All right, in that case, we should uh, thank Tim again for the great talk. Thanks so much. Well. Thank Thanks you. very much, everybody, for listening. Hopefully it was not too soon too early for you. Um, no, I'm, I'm good now. The coffee's kicked in, so. All right, thank you so much, and I hope to see you in soon. Thank you. Great, great to see you all. Hope to see you at Icra. See you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.